So I'm an, I'm an artist, and um, when I give talks about art and design or art and innovation, I like to keep in mind um, something that the conceptual artist Solowit said in relationship to his 25 sentences on conceptual art. In sentence two and three, he says, rational judgments repeat rational judgments. Irrational judgments lead to new experience. Um, so my brief presentation tonight, I'm going to dedicate it to uh, irrational judgments and new experiences. Um, so the, the work that I do often involves the idea of a biotope, which is a small environment shared by multiple species, often including humans. Um, the work that I do may also involve the concept of trans-species giving, which is the idea that the commonalities that exist between living organisms are such that we might be able to be of assistance to another life form. Uh, and lastly, I'm also interested in non-anthropocentric design, which is design that attempts to consider the aims, desires, and per per perceptual landscapes of the non-human. Um, so I do all kinds of weird things. Um, uh, I do art and science collaboration, which is probably not not anything that's new to this to this this room. Um, but I do things like I design alternative forms of housing for land hermit crabs. I culture lichen on the sides of skyscrapers in New York City, uh, and I program AI stations that play human music for wild feeder birds. Um, I also um, knit sweaters for plants. Um, this piece is called Giant Sequoia. It's a giant sequoia sapling wearing a knit sweater. I started knitting sweaters for plants when I was in graduate school. This is way back in the late 1990s. And at the time, I wanted to visually represent, I wanted to visually communicate the frustration I felt at wanting to help the natural world, but the feeling that I had that my own efforts were, were too small or potentially even futile in nature. Um, so that sort of sentiment is really sort of drives a lot of the work that I do. And I'm going to talk just briefly about a couple of projects that involve plants, and then I'm going to talk about the floorboard project. Um, so my current studio is in the World, world Trade 4 building. Uh, you guys probably know this, the new World Trade buildings. There's seven of them in addition to World Trade One. Uh, and uh, my artist residency has put me at the 65th floor of World Trade Four, which is absolutely extraordinary, especially in New York. I have all of this amazing space. Um, and that's actually the view out of my studio. And the amazing thing about the 65th floor is you can actually see the curvature of the earth from up there. Um, the other thing that you get to see up there are the tops of all the modernist buildings that are around us. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is when people built these buildings, they weren't really thinking about even taller buildings looking down on them because they didn't really bother finishing their rooftops. Uh, and so I, I think it's just kind of wonderful because there's all of this extra space up there in addition to um, the cooling systems and what they need for maintenance. And they, um, people are not allowed up on the tops of these buildings, but they're nicely manicured with tar and gravel. Um, and this led me to um, the, the project that I'm currently proposing, which is called the Manhattan Tundra Project. And the Manhattan Tundra Project is eight inches of topsoil, um, enough to allow for an emergent ecosystem. So we don't really know what will, what will live on the tops of these buildings. There's all kinds of interesting things, um, interesting environmental perturbations that they have to sort of contend with. But the idea is to get people that live in the buildings um, to pay attention to our shared ecosystems at this height. Uh, and it's also a machine vision project. We, we're going to put um, some webcams up there so that the people in the buildings can log on and see what sorts of um, emergent ecosystems uh, and what other kinds of life forms are sharing their structures with them. Uh, so I'm going to talk really briefly about a couple of projects that are located in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, I am head of the sculpture concentration and the concentration of intermedia in Camden, New Jersey. And uh, Camden, New Jersey is the old industrial base of Philadelphia. It's the place where a lot of raw materials were taken from Pennsylvania and, and um, uh, and um, uh, it was a, a major manufacturing site that is now uh, sort of a post-industrial landscape that has a lot of the same problems that other old post-industrial landscapes have. It's, um, we have uh, soil contaminants, we have water contamination, um, not a lot of jobs, it's a food desert. Um, but it's also an extraordinary place. It has perhaps more city gardens than any, uh, I'm told it may have more city um, community gardens than any other city in the United States. Um, I also like to tell some of my students, I actually have some students from Camden, New Jersey in my classes, and one of the interesting things about Camden, New Jersey is 
historians will tell us that per square foot, Camden and places like Camden may have been um, during the lead up to World War II and during the war, these may have been the most productive places on earth. So uh, I like to tell my students from Camden to be proud of where they come from because these kinds of sites um, are you know, what allowed us to, um, to overcome fascism in the past century. So they need our love and they need our, uh, they need our attention. Uh, in any event, students of mine in Camden, New Jersey, participated in something called the Biodesign Challenge last year. And they were thinking a lot about the accumulation of plastics along the Delaware. And they made this, which is called the Plasto Match. Um, it's hard to tell, but this is actually the sh shape of a stomach. This means plastic stomach. Uh, and th this Plasto Match actually degrades. It actually consumes plastic by virtue of living fungi. Um, so I don't know if you guys know this, maybe some of you do, fungi can actually eat plastic. Uh, and my wonderful students went and did the primary research to discover what kinds of white rot fungi, which are um, reishi and turkey tail and oyster mushrooms, things that we, that us humans eat, um, what kinds of white rot fungi actually um, prefer what kinds of plastic. And um, my students love to tell everybody that um, this is a this is a domestic system. This is uh, increasing the habitat for this life form in your homes. So my students like to tell people that if you only use a very tiny amount of plastic, and if you're willing to cut it into little tiny pieces, uh, this plasto match system may erase your plastic footprint. Um, so that's the plasto match. Um, the other project that that um, that I'm doing right now with my students um, addresses what one of the researchers at Rutgers is calling the ans the insect Armageddon. And um, uh, cognitive psychologists tell us that if we want to adapt a new behavior to our repertoire, one of the best ways to do it is to connect it to a ritual. That way it becomes a habit. So we're proposing, um, these are called seed bombs, sometimes people call them seed balls, we're calling them earth balls. We're proposing earth balls for Earth Day. And the wonderful thing about um, earth balls is that you can color them. They're kind of like Easter eggs. Uh, and um, uh, my students and the community uh, of Camden, New Jersey, are doing a project this coming Earth Day where we're actually, we're actually planting each earth ball with wildflowers that correspond to the color of the ball. So the people in North Camden are making seed balls that are colored pink, but that contain a wide variety of um, native species that are in the shades of pink wildflowers. So in Northern Camden, we're, we're gonna have a swash of pink wildflowers. This is, uh, that's a picture of milkweed right there. And then in the next section down, which crosses the university and the Ben Franklin Bridge, it's going to be red. This is um, uh, cardinal flowers. Um, and then we have a swatch for orange, and then yellow, and then green, and then blue and purple. So we're, in, we're turning the entire city into a color field painting. This is a community project to do this. Um, and uh, it's another way of using the discursive capital of art to plant more native species. So the project is called the Camden Color Field Project. And I'm just absolutely thrilled to talk to my presenters this evening about, about the best seeds for it. Um, but information on this is on my website. And if any of you guys want to make a color field painting in your community, please log on and do it. Um, the takeaway though, you guys, is earth balls equal Earth Day. Earth balls equal Earth Day. You can buy them on Etsy, you can make them yourself, but please start exchanging earth balls for Earth Day. Um, so that leads, leads me to the last pr uh, project that I'm gonna talk about that has to do with plants. Uh, and this is for potted plants. I have a thing for potted plants. I've spent a lot of time around them knitting those sweaters and thinking about how extraordinary it is that we, you know, we pot these these life forms and we bring them into our homes. You know, we, we try to take a little bit of the outside world and bring it inside. Um, and sometimes it doesn't always work out so well for the life form. Um, so this particular project is for potted plants. And it's actually an homage to the Italian cyberneticist Valentino Brattenberg. Uh, in the 1970s, Brattenburg designed through a series of thought experiments simple vehicles that were based on the neuronal systems of insects. And these simple vehicles um, could be programmed for avoidance or attraction, but he was interested in the fact that these simple vehicles displayed what us humans 
thought to what, what, what looked like to us humans to be very complex kinds of behavioral patterns. Um, so this project has, uh, um, the title of this project is The End of Plant Project and Act of Trans-Species Giving. And the project has created a floraborg. That's a term I coined for an entity that is part plant and part robot. And I'm going to show you a little three minute, um, <laughs> a little three minute video of the project. And um, then I'm going to talk about uh, where the project has taken us. centuries, humans have been caring for potted plants in an effort to make our environment a little more like theirs. Sometimes with disastrous consequences. But a team of artists and scientists at Rutgers University are working to change all of this. They are creating in the plants robotic supports that allow potted house plants to freely seek sunlight and water. This effort is being spearheaded by artist Elizabeth de Marais and engineer Dr. Quincy Zhao. For de Marais, the impetus behind the project is artistic. My interest in creating this piece lies in the poetic implications of taking an immobile object like a house plant and potentially turning it into a free agent. Uh, so depending upon uh, programming or, or merger properties, each end of plant may <laughs> be potentially cooperative or even <laughs> kinds of <laughs> So here is uh, my office in the school in the area of the Now we have three end of plants up and running. And they were capable of uh, uh, finding the sunlight and go to the uh, water station uh, to support the needs of the species they carry. And uh, in the morning, near the window, and the window with the water, they go to the water station, and the people who walk by were the water. I think it's really nice to have a little bit of greenness in the engineering building because it's always machines over here and there. And the second thing, I guess I just want to homebuy it. Wonderful. <laughs> 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 So um, the project has created um, a community of floorboards, and um, they, uh, it's, it's an AI system. They can find where sunlight and water is in accordance with the needs of the species that they support. Um, when they're thirsty, they actually, via a little infrared sensor, go and find a water dispenser. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but there's a big sign on that that says, if a floorboard is in the vicinity, please give it a cup of water. Um, so the, the project has actually, interestingly enough, um, it started with an irrational idea. Um, but it's led to all kinds of interesting things. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're uh, designing transpiration collectors. Um, these collect the, the transpired water, which is a byproduct of photosynthesis, in an effort to perhaps allow the plant to be a little bit more self-sufficient in terms of watering. Um, the, 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 the project is also creating a cyber-physical interface that functions as a conduit to signal and digitize information about environmental perturbations from plant to machine, and by extension, from plant to humans. Um, we're also creating a machine vision module that allows the plants to monitor each, other health, each other's health. So that's actually Ahmed Egamel right there. Um, and uh, that's, a, um, that's an, an algorithm that indicates that, uh, that a plant has wilted. 
Um, so this is information on the project, uh, if any of you guys are interested or you want to contribute or, or, um, or be involved. Um, but um, I'm just going to talk for just a moment um, about the next floorboard project that I hope to tackle. It's titled The Floorboard Navigator. The Navigator is our next answer to meeting the new needs of natural life forms. This floorboard combines the basic features of the Indo plant with GPS, autonomous driving technology, and constant online weather updates so that an endangered plant species threatened with climate change might travel to more favorable conditions. <laughs> With climate scientists predicting vastly unpredictable weather patterns, this project maintains that innovative technological solutions can be brought to bear upon a great number of problems involving the present existence and future survival of many life forms. The intended audience of the floorboard navigator is someone who, while driving in a car or crossing a street, might pause to contemplate a slowly ambulating floorboard. <laughs> bearing on its back an endangered plant destined for better places. Thank you.